Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our plenary session will begin right now. Uh, before I introduce Professor Fakrul Alam, uh, let me first invite him to the podium first. Uh, may I request uh, Professor Fakrul Alam to come up on this stage. Professor Fakrul Alam, Fakrul sir, uh, my mentor and at the same time uh, my inspiration in so many different ways. Someone who has guided me over the years through some of these uh, materials has introduced me to <coughs> literary theory has been uh, very important in my life and I'm personally grateful to him. But now I'm going to actually introduce him formally. Uh, Professor Fokrul Alam is the Pro Vice Chancellor of East West University and was until recently the Professor of English at the University of Dhaka. Uh, he has many publications, he has published uh, many books. Uh, he began with uh, a book on Daniel Defoe, which was a very solid research work, but then he also both wrote uh, about Rabindranath, colonial situation, uh, post-colonial literature, and simultaneously also translated, and he has a hefty body of work, uh, which is available. His publications include Rabindranath Tagore and National Identity Formation in Bangladesh, Essays and Reviews, The Essential Tagore, which he edited and where he translated uh, Imperial Entanglements and Literature in English, South Asian Writers in English, which he edited, uh, Jivanananda Dash, Selected Poems, which is uh, a, a book of translation, Bharati Mukherjee, which is uh, uh, one of his uh, pioneering research works on uh, Mukherjee. His translation of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's Unfinished Memoirs was published in 2012 by University Press in Bangladesh, Penguin Books in India, and Oxford University Press in Pakistan. He received the Sark Literature Award in 2012 at the Sark Literature Festival of 2012 held in Lucknow, India on 18 March 2012. He was awarded the Bangla Academy Puroshkar in the translation category for 2013 on February 24, 2013. His translations of Ocean of Sorrow, the late 19th century Bengali epic narrative Bishat Shindu, Bishat Shindu, Shindu by Mir Musharraf Hussain and Prison Diaries by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, both published by Bangla Academy in November 2016 and February 2018 respectively are his most recent book publications. Now I would request Fokusar to begin his plenary speech. Uh, use the mic, of course. Hopefully you'll be able to follow me. My paper is titled, what did you title it? Oh, Karl Marx in India, Post-Colonial Perspective. And let me start with the introduction. Growing up intellectually in the 1960s and 70s, and becoming increasingly aware of the progressive side of politics, local and global, as well as its reactionary elements, who could remain unaffected by extracts from a classic of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels' Uvga, such as the Communist Manifesto, or the long extracts and pardon my pronunciation from Gundry's or the German ideology collected in theory anthologies? It was clear to me even then that the Marx I knew had hinted some essential truths about history in his writings. Nevertheless, I'm not a Marxist, and activism or party politics have never attracted me. Nor can I claim that I came to know a lot about Marx as I furthered myself intellectually. If then, I stand before you today to read a paper on Marx and British India, 
it is only because of the conjunction of two things. The first of these is that I simply could not say no to Hassan al Zayed when he requested me to write a paper for this bicentenary conference. The other reason why I'm here before you displaying the temerity to speak on Marx before committed Marxists and specialists, I don't think I see many today, on him with so little expertise on the subject is that soon after Zayed had made his request in a Delhi bookshop this October, I came across a book called Karl Marx on India. This is the book in case anyone wants to buy it later. It's a very good buy. Uh, uh, edited by Iqbal Hussain, former professor of history at Aligarh Muslim University, and published under the aegis of Aligarh Historian Society by Tulaka Books in 2006, the volume seemed even more attractive to me because it contained a long introduction by the eminent historian and professor emeritus of the same university, Professor Ifan Habib. There was something else in my mind then too. Edward Said's indictment of Marx for his Orientalist perspective in Orientalism. Since that book has been seminal for me, ever since I first read it in 1980, I thought, why not explore how right or wrong Said was to label Marx thus by gauging the importance of Marx's writings and assessment of India in our time for this conference? But my discovery that Marx had written, for it, written the essays collected in the book in English, and the fact that I was going to read a paper on him in an English department conference Another di added, di added another dimension to my paper. Why not also read the essays to assess Marx as a writer of English prose? My paper does has five parts. In the first, I discuss the genesis and nature of Marx's writings on in India. In the second, I attempt to provide an account of his extensive, indeed astonishing knowledge of Indian affairs of the period he focuses on. I also try to trace the evolution of his thoughts on India during that span of time in this section. In the third, I comment on his English prose style and the rhetorical strategies he adopts in the essays and reports. In the fourth section, I endeavor to highlight the inc incisiveness of his critique of British rule in India and his indictment of the British for the way they exploited it and brutalized Indians in the course of the rule. I then offer my viewpoint on Said's evaluation of Marxist orientalizing of India and the controversy that ensued when a few leading Marxists assaulted the Palestinian American critique for being so offensive over the fountainhead of their thought. I also have a rushed conclusion, which I hope I can read uh, despite my handwriting. <coughs> the first part, why, how, and what Karl Marx wrote on India. The 59 articles and pieces collected in Karl Marx on India were all originally published in the progressive and popular <coughs> excuse me, American newspaper, New York Daily Tribune, from 1853 to 1861. The book also includes a few articles written by Marx's great friend and collaborator Engels, as well as excerpts, as well as excerpts from the letters relating to India. In addition, the volume has a very helpful entry on references to India elsewhere in the works compiled by Professor Habib. Professor Hussain's prefatory note indicates that Marx originally contributed to the Tribune a few pieces on India that he had written in German in 1852, but that Engels translated for him into English then. However, from 1853 onwards, his writings on India in the newspaper were his own forays into English journalistic prose, and thus, quote unquote, constitute a separate genre among his works. In other words, they are of interest not only because Marx's writings are not otherwise associated with Indian affairs in a sustained manner, as is the case here, but also because they reveal his abilities in writing English pieces for a wide readership year after year. Hussein notes though that Marx hated writing them and deemed them distractions from the major works he was engaged in at that time, and they would eventually make him famous, such as Grundis, the contribution to a critic of political economy, and the first volume of Capital. But his state of finances was such that, apart from the money he made from his tribune articles on India and other contemporary happenings, and the support Engels provided him regularly, he had nothing much to go on that would support him and his family at this time. In other words, his Indian articles, he wrote his Indian articles because he had to. However, it is quite clear from a reading of the 59 pieces collected in Karl Marx on India that he wrote, most of them not, uh, he, that he wrote most of them, not merely because he felt that he had to write whatever he could for money, 
but primarily because he's quite stirred by events unfolding in the subcontinent in the 1850s and driven to pursue their deeper implications. <clears throat> it even seems likely that these events could be grist for his developing ideas about capitalism and historical change. In particular, he was attracted to the ravages wrought by British rule in India and the simmering discontent that it had caused among the people of the subcontinent until the lead came off completely in the eruption of 1857. Marx subsequently became quite absorbed in reporting and analyzing the causes and consequences of the Sepoy mutiny and appraising the extent of English culpability in the carnage that had occurred then. Marx's sources for his Indian articles in the Tribune are various. He seemed to have scoured British parliamentary papers, newspaper reports, minutes of the East India Company, historical accounts, and travel writings on India. He appeared too to have gone over carefully in his British library for his own contemporary as well as earlier economic tracts on the trade with India, speeches delivered in the House of Commons, letters he had come across on what was going on in the subcontinent, <coughs> memoirs of Englishmen who had served there or had written books on the people of India, and even translations of classical Indian texts such as Manusriti. Manusriti. It is obvious that along with Engels, <coughs> Marx quickly grew in confidence in mastering the political, social, and economic configurations and history, and even the geography and the topography of India. The Tribune pieces on India that Marx and Engels contributed collectively in Marx, Karl Marx in India vary in length quite a bit as well as differ in the intensity of the coverage. Some are merely brief notes, while others are of considerable length. Some are well-written entries content to merely report on current happenings or describe the course of the world succinctly, while others are analytical and draw out the implications <coughs> of what was going on in the cataclysm starring the subcontinent. Whenever necessary, Marx provides abundant facts and figures to back up his points or make them. Whether he wants to illustrate the astonishing discrepancy between the huge revenue earned from India by the East India Company or, or detail the miserly attitude of its administrators who cared not a fig for the welfare of the people of the subcontinent but lived lavish lives, his facts back him up. At times, Marx offers quite detailed accounts of the extent of the uprisings and the fatalities. On other occasions, he provides abundant statistics on the trade between England and India or the business transactions involved, involving opium between India and China that were profiting only the English rulers and traders, exploiting the Indian growers and doping the Chinese customers. As an aside here, let me direct your attention to Amitav Ghosh's excellent 2011 novelistic account of the ravages wrought by the opium trade on the Chinese and the profits made by mostly English merchants in the river of smoke. However, to come back to Marx and his report on the Sepoy mutiny in India, he presents the major aspects of the situation expertly. He comments perceptively on the different stages of the campaign and outlines graphically the tactics followed by the English in quelling the rebellion. He underscores the economic aspects of the mutiny and the financial implications for England of the continuing campaign, probing into all the figures he could get hold of. In the articles written as early as 1853, he seems to be hinting at the disruptive and destructive potential of English rule. In his final contributions, he appears to be saying that though the mutineers had been subdued and the country pacified, Indians were restive, and there were ample signs of resurgence of Indians fed up with the way the company had been abusing and exploiting them. For sure, remembering that he had come so late to the subcontinent in his writings, and considering that his articles on India are only marginal to his main preoccupations, one can only marvel at Marx's mastery of Indian history, finances, social stratifications, and geography and much else. Such mastery reminds me of Daniel Defoe, admittedly quite unlike Marx in almost every way, who had once boasted about himself in the third person. He had the world at his fingertips. However, as will be clear as I read on, Marx is to be more like Jonathan Swift in his tonal uh, you know, projections in his mastery of anti-colonial satire than the self-proclaimed projector propagandist of empire that Defoe was. So, <clears throat> so I move on to my next section, Marx as a writer of English prose. As I indicated above, one of the pleasures of writing this paper for me was my discovery of the power of Marx's English prose. <coughs> the first thing that can be said about it 
is the clarity with which you can analyze or describe happenings in the language. But he is also quite expressive and creative in his word usage. For example, he characterizes the Conservative Party politician Lord Stanley's parliamentary maneuverings as symptomatic of these coalescent times in the way he had found a formula in which the opposite views are combined together. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? Coalescent times? And isn't it something we could apply to the Bangladesh we live in now? <coughs> and especially our country in its election year? The phrase is from July 1, from his July 1, 1853 piece, simply titled India, where he ends sarcastically by telling his readers that he intends in the next one to expose the bearing of the Indian question on different parts, parties in Great Britain, and the benefit the poor Hindu may reap from the quarreling of the aristocracy, the manicracy, and the milocracy about his amelioration. Now, we may not have an aristocracy in Bangladesh, but aren't the words maniocracy and milocracy so apt for the people who dominate our economy and politics in the time we live in as well? In fact, the heavy irony we can detect in that quote is one of the dominant notes of Marx's long pieces on India. The relatively long next tribune entry of July 11, 1853, this in a company, its history and results, is full of such irony comments, as are many of the other pieces that follow. Marx thus comments specifically about the sharp philanthropy of the company while, he expo while exposing what he calls it hypocritical peace cant since it's actually bent on showing the way Indians were being exploited and the country denuded by self-aggrandizing company officials with the assistance of the hypocritical backers in English politics. <coughs> Marx, for sure, can be quite direct and devastating in his characterization of such politicians, as in the next piece titled The Government of India, where he assaults frontally the politicians skirmishing in the House of Commons on company affairs with a sentence like the following one, quote, during the discussion all was thesis for the minister, Sir Charles Wood, who was an Anglo-Indian big politician and member of parliament of the British Empire, was the ass officially put to the task of feeding up on them. In addition, Sir Charles receives the crown of another Manu. Note to how scathing Mark can be when he castigates the liberal proponents of free trade, siding with the politicians supporting the company in their aggressive policies on India. He criticizes the collusive practices thus, quote, the peace ministry at this moment does everything to secure its untamed cordial with the peace party, Manchester School, who are opposed to any kind of warfare, except by cotton bales and price currents. His characterization on Benjamin Disraeli's slide as an orator and man of principle by using inversion in another essay, the Indian question, is similarly quite devastating and unforgettable. But he declares that as an orator, quote, once he succeeded in giving even commonplaces the pointed appearance of epigrams. Now he contrasts to very even epigrams in the conventional dullness of respectability. Note the use of chiasmus in his contemptuous description of the way the, upper, the Mughal emperor was being indulged by the British for their purposes. Quote, the present great Mughal even more favored than Napoleon in captivity, finds himself able to back the disease by his sallies and his sallies by the disease. On other occasions, Marx writes English prose that is dispassionate and clear, as when he discusses the course of the meeting in essay after essay, always making sure that he had data to illustrate his chief points. For his American and English readers, he makes telling comparisons when writing about India, so that they can picture his problems easily, as when he notes in the British rule in India how Hindustan is an equally of Asiatic dimensions in its varied geography and topography. However, he qualifies this, the statement a little later by saying that, yet in a social point of view, Hindustan is not Italy but the island of India. Clinching this point with an additional sentence by states and the strange combination of Italy and Ireland, a world of voluptuousness and of a world of woes, can be traced to the religious tradition of the peoples of the country are here too. In the rhetorical strategy he adopts in his assaults in the East India Company, though, Marx seems to be at times in the tradition of another great thinker and fierce critic of the East India Company, Edmund Burke, whom he had quoted approvingly at and at length in his critic earlier in describing what he calls the close and abject spirit of bureaucracy. 
to make sure this particle point, let me quote here at length first, Burke describing the perfidious operations of the East India Company in India in Parliament on the 1st of December 1783. And this is a quote from Burke's speech. My assertion is that the company never has made a treaty which they have not broken. Let me recapitulate some heads. The treaty with the Mughal, by which we stipulated to pay him 260,000 pounds annually was broken. The treaty, this treaty they have broken and not paid him a shilling. They broke their treaties with Nizam and with Hyder Ali. And in the speech he goes on, Marx, uh, sorry, Bulk goes on using broken, broken, broken for a long time. Marx does the same thing, but I'll only take a little, a brief short quote. And here is Marx reporting on the company's usurpation of supremacy in India through treachery in his 1853 article, The Future of British Rule in India. How came it that English supremacy was established in India? The paramount power of the great Mughal was broken by the Mughal Aishras. The power of the Vaishras was broken by the Maharatas. The power of the Maharatas was broken by the Afghans. And while all was struggling against all, the Britons rushed in and was enabled, the Briton rushed in and was able to subdue them all. In other words, to Marx the British, I think I skipped a page, sorry. No, I didn't. Yeah. In other words, to Marx, the British, as Burke had also noted, are like all previous usurpers of India, in that they have taken over India through acts of bad faith repeatedly. The only difference being that they have outdone them all. I'd like to provide another example of how, in his Indian writings, Marx's thinking as well as his post-style and rhetorical strategy made him sound quite similar to Burke's great speech on East India Bill, by once again beginning with the great anglo irish writer and statements unforgettable lines on the uniquely destructive nature of the British conquest of India. And this is Burke. The several eruptions of Arabs, Turks, and Persians, for the greater part, ferocious, bloody, and wasteful in the extreme. Our entrance into the dominion of the country was as generally with small comparative efficient of blood being introduced by various frauds and delusions and by taking advantage of the incurable, blind and senseless animosity which the several country powers bear towards each other rather than by open force. But the difference in favor of the first conquerors is this. The Asiatic conquerors very soon abated of their ferocity because they made the conquered country their own. But under the English government, all this order is reversed. The Tartar invention was mischievous, but it is our protection that destroys India. What follows will show that Marx is clearly equating Marx's characterization of company rule and its ill effects in India, but with a crucial distinction. So this is Marx. Arabs, Turks, Tartars, Mughals, who had successively overrun India, soon became Hinduized. The barbarian conquerors being by an eternal law of history conquered themselves by the superior civilization of the subjects. The British was the first conqueror superior and therefore inaccessible to Hindu civilization. They destroyed it by breaking up the native communities, by uprooting the native industry, and by leveling all that was great and elevated in the native society. The historic pages of the rule in India report hardly anything beyond their destruction. The work of regeneration hardly transpired through a heap of ruins. Nevertheless, it has begun. In a much later Tribune piece published in 1858, while describing caustically the outrages being committed by plundering British soldiers, Marx seems to be intertextually evoking the part of Burke's speech on Fox's Day Bill I've extracted above yet again. This to me is evident in the following sentence. Quote from Marx, the Kalmuk hordes of Genghis Khan and Taimur falling upon the city like a swarm of locusts and devouring everything that came their way must have been a blessing to a country compared with the eruption, note the word, of these Christian, civilized, chivalrous, and gentle British soldiers. And note the irony also. Like Burke, Marx is Indian history as one where successive invaders took advantage of a divided and weak country to conquer it. The list and the rhetorical patterns are at times strikingly similar. One outstanding difference is that Burke is saying that all con the conquerors except the English made India their own country, accepting it as their own. However, Marx states unequivocally something else that Burke does not. 
He sees the English as different from any, the other conquerors because cruel though they were, and as destructive as the others, they became assimilated because they had conquered a superior civilization. In contrast, he felt that the English, being superior, and had, had unwittingly taken on a crucial group of, of regeneration of a moribund, atrophying civilization. This is a point that I will take up in discussing Marx's essays on British India vis-a-vis -vis Said's critique of him in my penultimate section of my paper. However, now I would also like to use this quote to sounds from the stylistic and rhetorical aspects of Marx's English prose to deal fully with something that I have indirectly been hinting at, Burke's sharp and incisive criticism of British colonial policy. In a sense, I do not need to labor the point I intend to make in this section about Marx as someone who is fiercely critical of colonization, especially of British colonization. Most of what I commented on a little while back about his style and rhetorical strategy pointed at the direction, as does my comments on his falling power to great extent in denouncing the East India Company's continuous pillaging of Indian resources. Nevertheless, a lot more remains to be said about the extent of Marx's censure of colonial rule in the articles he, writes, he, he, he wrote, collected in Karl Marx on India, for there is much that is important there that I have not covered. For example, as early as his first article written in English in 1853, he recommends that all, quotation, quote, legislation on Indian affairs be postponed until the, voices, the voice of the native shell have been heard, unquote. Something he feels the present government has not been doing at all. Marx would not have the company's charter renewed by the government because he's convinced that all they want is the privilege of plundering India for the space of 20 years. He denounces the permanent settlement of 1790 and mentions time and again how the Zamindari and Rayatwari system thus set up are only so many forms of fiscal exploitation in the hands of the company. Marx is convinced that even those who criticize government policy and argued for free trade, like the Manchester politician John Bright, was as culpable as the government of trying to ruin India, because his special perspective is informed by his need to advocate dumping English textiles in a captive market. A special note for us here in Bangladesh in this regard is the essay, The British Rule in India. In it, Marx says the British East India Company at par with the Dutch East India Company as far as colonial rule is concerned, since both had managed to break down the entire framework of countries they had colonized without doing anything to rebuild them. As proof of the British company's destructive policies, it turns to the plight of the weavers of Bengal, where agriculture and textiles have both been devastated by British rule. He gestures that how Europe had once received the admirable textures of Indian labor, but notes how things have changed ever since the British intruder broke up the Indian handloom and destroyed the spinning wheel in the process of driving out Indian cottons from the European market. Marx correlates the decrease of Indian textile exports with the monopoly exerted by British Muslims to India and to the decimation of the population of Dhaka. To quote what he says about the impact of colonization on our city, let me quote at some length to indicate how Marx describes the outcome of the fatal embrace of British colonial policy in our part of India at that time. And this is a long quote. From 1880 to 1836, the export of twist from Great Britain to India rose in proportion of 1 to 5,200. In 1824, the export of British Muslims to India hardly amounted to 100,000 years. While in 1837, it surpassed 64,000, 100,000 years. But at the same time, the population of Dhaka, of Dhaka, and this is Mark saying this, decreased from 150,000 inhabitants to 20,000. This decline of Indian towns celebrated for the fabrics was by no means the worst consequence. British steam and science uprooted over the whole, whole surface of Hindustan, the union between agriculture and manufacturing industry. In the same article, Marx goes on in this intensely anti-colonial vein to detail the company's destruction of the social fabric of India, as well as its economic ruin. In other contributions he made to the Tribune, Marx suggests other causes and consequences of the British invasion of India. In the article titled, List in the Company, Its History and Results, he emphasizes how the maws of capitalism 
must always devour new territories. He shows how the English nation, having simultaneously lost the colonies in North America, felt the necessity of elsewhere reigning some great colonial empire. Surely an insight of great relevance even now in our age of globalization and empire, as Hart and Negri says, say. However, reading Marx on India can be quite revealing to anyone interested in our history, also because of the way he highlights the inefficiency of the East India Company's operations. After all these stresses, it laid waste not only swaths of territory and not merely popularized and often decimated the people of India, it also plagued the British government financially. How then did it survive? For one thing, Marx points out, it did so only through bribing its government and corrupting its politicians. In addition, English colonization succeeded, it seems to Marx, through a frightful system of torture in India and a successful imitation of the Roman divida et imperia policy in the subcontinent. At home, on the other hand, it depended on buying of politicians and perpetuating lies about the rule, and in India, on the other, it expanded and held on to power through its policy of divided rule and unrestrained use of force. In the series of articles he wrote on the Sepoy mutiny, Marx emphasizes to his English-speaking readers the atrocities committed by the British Army and declares unequivocally that the Indian excesses were the inevitable outcome of the colonizers' bloodthirstiness from the beginning of the rule to the present moment. As he puts it in the Indian Revolt, however infamous the conduct of the Sepoys, it is only the reflex in a constituted form of England's own conduct in India. Not only during the epoch of the foundation of the Western Empire, but even during the last 10 years of a long settled rule. Marx goes on in this vein for quite a few paragraphs, as if in response to the hue and outcry in Britain to the Indian rebels', rebels brutality during the mutiny. To him, Indian excesses are nothing but a demonstration of the rule of historical retribution, in which its instrument is forged not by the offended, but by the offender itself. Surely, very few Westerners in his time would have had the courage as well as the conviction to castigate the English as much as Marx did here. He goes on to underscore British distortion of what was going on, caustically pointing out to his readers that it would be an unmitigated mistake to suppose that all the cruelty is on the side of the Sepoys and all the milk of human kindness flows on the side of the British. Marx is bent on exposing the extent of colonial propaganda and disinformation meted out to the British reading public about Indian excesses circulated by the company's one-sided broadcasts. His intent is to portray, even within the brief compass of newspaper articles, the real history of British colonial occupation of the subcontinent and the actual human cost of the war to Indians as well as to the British. He stresses the British forces disproportionately brutal response to the Indian insurrection, so blatantly concealed by company fed journalists and politicians in England and calls attention to the extent of loot and plunder carried out by the British troops after each victory over the rebels. In a sarcastic comment on the looting propensities of the British soldier after the victories, Marx declares, quote, the Hindu or Sikh is better disciplined, less thieving, less rapacious than the incomparable model of a warrior, the British soldier, not the irony again. In the later articles, while detailing the extent of the British pillage after the victories over the mutineers, Marx notes the impending signs of yet another famine in Bengal. He declares that while there, has been, there had been no famines until then in the 19th century, in former times, and in, ever since the British occupation, they have been the source of terrible sufferings. He even makes the East India Company and English colonization completely responsible for the great Bengal famine of 1870. I should say 1770 correction. Marx is relentless in exposing the way the English continued their attempts to people India after the mutiny in fresh ways. In a July 1858 piece on taxation in India, he makes a comparative survey on the burden of taxation borne by an individual in Indian provinces and that encountered by European ones. He concludes then that, that the British claim of light taxation in the subcontinent, in actuality, crushes the mass of Indian people to the dust, and its extraction necessitates a resort to such spams as torture, for instance. The bulk of revenue thus gathered, he shows, is spent on the governing class of the colony, 
and their backers in England so that they can thrive and indulge themselves. Birds feel that nothing much would change when company rule gave it to more direct rule by the, uh, sorry, Marx. Marx feels that nothing much would change when company rule gave way to more direct rule by the British government. One could expect more of the same extortionist debilitating policies pursued by the colonizers, whether public or private ones. <clears throat> Marx depicts the manner in which the British Empire was operating so that it could profit from and simultaneously ruin the people of two of its colonies in a series of features on the British opium trade to China. Exposing the pretensions of the oft-proclaiming civilizing mission of empire, Marx comes up with data that will reveal to him what he calls the flagrant self-contradiction of the Christian canting and civilization mongering British government. In short, Marx saw, saw no respite for Indians or for the Chinese until the British Empire crumbled from the nefarious policies pursued by the imperial forces at work. The post mutiny situation in his analysis indicated a lull before another storm broke out for him. It was only a matter of time to him for anti-British passions to flame again. And thus, and to sum up this section, we can conclude, Marx was consistently anti-colonial and fiercely so in his writings of India. We should have no doubts in our mind on that account. But I now come to the next section, was Marx an Orientalist? At the outset of this paper, let me remind you of the lines from the 1853 article, The Future Results of British Rule in India, that I've quoted earlier, where Marx has stated that the British, the last of the wave of conquerors of India, represented the first one superior to the Indians. It was, he implies, because of this reason, that not only resisted being Hinduized, Marx actually idealizes this, but had also unwittingly laid the foundation for Indian regeneration by breaking up the native industry. In the earlier 1853 piece, The British Rule in India, once again depicting British rapacity, hard-heartedness, and destructive actions, he claimed that the villages thus destroyed, idyllic though they may have seemed, quote, had always been a solid foundation of oriental despoticism, unquote. Marx goes as far as to claim that England had become the, quote, unconscious tool of history in bringing about the revolution, unquote. As we saw, while Burke had lamented the solely destructive tendencies of the British, to him they were unlike the earlier conquerors who had embraced a superior civilization and had been assimilated to it, for the British was touched by India. In contrast, as we also saw, Marx felt that surely, albeit unwittingly, Britain had begun the task of recharging a moribund people and uniting a divided subcontinent. In a piece written at the height of the mutiny in 18, 1957, 1857. Even while submitting British rapacity and cruelty, he refers to Hindu rituals of torture and self immolation of the times as acts stemming from a religion of cruelty. It was also seen from a reading of Marx in British India. I still have two pages, if, if that is the time. That to him, India and Indians could almost always be used synonymously with Hindustan and Hindu. Witness does his 1857 pieces on investigation of tortures in India, where he unequivocally sides with the mutinous Indians trying to expel a conqueror who had continuously abused them, wondering out aloud if the insurgent Hindus should be seen as guilty in the fear of revolt and conflict of the crimes and cruelties alleged against them. One of the two epigraphs with which Edward Said begins Orientalism is Marx's comment on the bourgeois and the shopkeeper in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. They cannot represent themselves, they must be represented. Said reprints this quote in his introduction to bring up the issues of representation and misrepresentation in the discursive tradition he had categorized throughout the title of his book. Through the title of his book. In the text itself, Said associates Marx with writers like Disraeli, Burton, and Nerval who use words such as orient, oriental, oriental despoticism as if intertextuality to, quote, carry on a lengthy discussion between themselves by using such generalities, unquote. Still later in the book, Said takes a more sustained look at Marx's characterization of the nature of oriental despoticism and the belief that England's superior civilization would finally force a moribund society to revive 
At after what had seemed till then, the con Japanese conquest of the subcontinent forever. In other words, Said suggests that even Marx had stereotyped India and Indians. And to put it in terms of the central thesis of his book, originalized it, carrying in on in the process a romantic redemptive project, uh, which is the quote, they cannot represent themselves, they must be represented, which actually Said uh, puts in context by quoting Goethe, who, uh, who is the romantic here, rather than considering the people of the subcontinent as human material. Was Marx essentially right in his comments or too Eurocentric and too sweeping as Said implies? His comments on the reductive nature of Marx's Indian writings have certainly given rise to an ideological storm among Marxist historians and post-colonialists. Here we have in his space, and I should tell you that I've read the literature, or a lot of it, and there's a lot of it, and I'm being very selective here. Here I will have space to indicate only briefly the currents and counter cross counter currents, cross currents generated by the storm. Committed Marxists like Aja Ahmed and Irfan Habib have no doubt that the Palestinian American had misread Marx's comments. Ahmed's, in theory, has a long chapter called Orientalism and After, Ambivalence and Metropolitan Location in the Work of Edward Said, in which he attempts a demolition job of Said's entire critical stance, finding only his commitment to Palestine in his public position and writings on behalf of his people worthy of praise. All else he tries to prove his methodologically sloppy and theoretically on unsound grounds. In another essay, completely focused on the subject that had been dealing with titled Marx on India, a clarification, but carrying forward the argument of ambivalence from the previous chapter, he finds Said too summary in dealing with a specific subject, too cavalier and too simplistic in writing about Marx. Or as Ahmed puts it, Said has fashioned a rhetoric of dismissal that had no room for other complexities of Marx's thought. To Ahmed, Marx occupied a position independent of both the Orientalist romantic and the colonial modernist mode. He was essentially unassailable at every stage. As for Irfan Habib, the net has its critical notes on Edward Said, where it cites Ahmed approvingly, and says out to further prove as well that overall, Said's argument in the Orientalism is too simplistic and sweeping, and methodologically unsound. His use of the quote, they cannot represent themselves, etc., is therefore an example of Habib of how Said had decontextualized and therefore misleadingly reproduced Marx's essentially essential position. I should have added mischievously too. Habib also makes a plea for his good, robust Orientalism, which he feels will prevail over present postmodernist fashions such as postcolonialism. Let me add that in his long introduction to Karl Marx in India, uh, Habib refers to Said's critical position on Said in a footnote, damning it for the moment as an example of his unhistorical attitude and directs the reader there to Ahmed and his own paper in defense of Orientalism, critical notes on Said, Edward Said. Nevertheless, in his very substantial, detailed, and solidly and lucidly argued paper, Karl Marx, his theories of Asian societies and colonial rule, another eminent Indian history, Bipan Chandra, historian, Bipan Chandra, evaluates Marx's writing on British India closely. He says that thou said that, Marx and Engels neither studied Asian societies for their own sake, nor had adequate knowledge regarding them. He suggests that, impressive though they may be, a balanced views of Marx's developing ideas and final views about India can be arrived at only after reading his later works. Chandra further suggests that the writing of the 1850s reveal the fragmentary and unformed character of Marx's views of India then. The set notion marks at the time of Asian society as stagnant, changeless, and incapable of change from within, led to his understanding of colonialism as performing a revolutionary role in India and Asia at the time. Marx did mean, Chandra says what he said about Asiatic despoticism, did see Asiatic society as basically stagnant, stationary, and changeless, and did suggest that it had no history and no social development in his early Indian writings of the 1850s, sorry, in these Indian writings of the early 1850s. He was therefore much within a, with Western tradition that did believe such things and that had essentialized India. Chandra also reminds us too that Marx did quote approvingly of the regenerating role of the West in India, although with the caveat that this destructive role should be viewed as a positive one. 
However, Chandra also reminds us that this last view was something Marx had totally abandoned. He points out that later, in the Grundis and Volume 3 of Capital, Marx would write otherwise and gesture at a more flexible, nuanced, and complete concept of Indian history and society. Nevertheless, it is essential to conclude for me by noting after over 30 pages of, sorry, nevertheless, it is essential to conclude by noting after over 30 pages of analysis, Chandra concludes at the midpoint of his paper that, and this is a quote, Marx's basic notions regarding Indian society were essentially incorrect, singling out his belief that Indian society had stagnated for millennia ever since its transition from primitive communism to class society and was therefore incapable of change from within as something completely untenable and something that can no longer be maintained. The remaining 40 plus pages of Chandra's paper basically substantiates his position vis-a-vis -vis Marx's. He does say that at the heart of the matter is that in India, British rule did dissolve the old economy, but it built nothing instead, which was, you know, regenerative. Whether it was the railway network that Marx felt had played a positive role or other aspects of colonial capital development, beyond a point. This is because Chandra Evers, whatever the British did was guided by national, not and not the situation of the metropolis, sorry, the national, not, not the national situation of the metropolis, but the metropolis itself. I'll read my last paragraph, which is handwritten, and as I said, I might stumble. My handwriting is just about as bad as you can imagine it to be. Marx did represent India in the uh, first half of the 1850s, but as he did, so he changed his views and later on, he moved from a static Indian India, made moribund by despotism to a great extent, but perhaps would have revised more substantially if he had more evidence. The evidence came out later, as Chandra points out. Said latched onto the marks he had found in his reading and made a point that was not wrong, but perhaps partial and not completely, but yet not completely unfair and not completely wrong or journalist if applied to Marx's early writings in India. Uh, what is wrong is my question in us trying to understand that Marx could have his blind spots at one time or the other like everyone else. And if Marx did have his blind spots, so what? What Marx did is amazing and important. His indictment of colonial rule in India is, I think, very comprehensive and very much worth learning from. Said's scholarship may also have its blind spots, but his account of representation, representation, misrepresentation you know, in, the orient, in the oriental tradition cannot be so easily dismissed as Ahmed and Habib have so cavalierly done. Marx is completely relevant for us and important despite his blind spots when he's writing about India. And so is Said when he's writing about Orientalism. Although, of course, there is no comparison between the achievement of the two. We are celebrating Marx's centenary, uh, bicentenary, and we'll continue to celebrate centenaries and bicentenaries. About Edward Said, who knows? But I have ample faith that he'll be remembered. Thank you.